Welcome to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese, a program that can help you become liberated in the modern world. Now, here's your host, Dr. Kevin W. Reese. Systemic racism. It's a thing here in America. And right now, there's a movement happening to end racism for good. There's protesters in the streets. There's some riots. There's some looters. Things are happening. People are upset. People are emotional. And rightfully so. It's been happening for a very long time. Welcome to episode number 54. Today, I'm bringing on my brother from another color mother, Taylor DeWitt. And we are going to discuss some very, very powerful topics. We're going to talk about what Black Lives Matters really means. And what's it mean when people, some people oppose it and they say, no, no, all lives matter. What's that really mean? What's the psychology of it? We're going to talk about our own personal run-ins with police. We're going to talk about how hip-hop has united races. And I'm going to ask Taylor some some big questions of what it's like to be African American and how old was he when he first understood racism and how old was he when he first got called the N word we're also going to talk about white privilege and what that really means this is an episode that needed to be done and until racism is cured It's really hard for Americans to evolve. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Listen closely. Taylor, welcome to the Peace Pod. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I want to start with the Dave Chappelle special because here's this legendary comedian who gets up on stage for a half an hour and there's really no jokes. It's social commentary he's upset he's making points to the Mm -hmm. uh, the movement that's happening and the outrage that's happening um what what did you think of the dave Chappelle 846 special uh i thought it was very much needed i thought it was something that a lot of people have been feeling but just couldn't really vocalize it just because of the angst and the anger and just the whole ball of emotions that people have been feeling for so many years. So I definitely think it was very poignant and very much needed at this time. And I think calling it social commentary is, I mean, it was some comedic moments, but I think you were dead on the money with, it was very much needed social commentary. Yeah. How long do you think the protests are going to last out there? Do you think this is something that's going to go on and on like it did in the civil rights movement? Or is this, is this going to be like Occupy Wall Street over and done in a few months? Well, a couple of things. One, I think that it's super sexy right now to a lot of people, especially people that, you know, feel a sense of guilt, you know, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So it's, they want to approach this and say yeah right on we support the movement so i think it's going to continue i think it's going to die down as it gets less sexy but i also think that the one thing people aren't thinking about much like the coronavirus is there's a whole second wave that's going to come once these officers that have been killing black people you know have their day in court and I highly doubt the way this system is built that every single one of them is going to be found guilty. I hope I'm wrong. I want to be proven wrong. But I feel that somebody is going to slip through the cracks and then, you know, it's going to, you know, rightfully so, rise up again. Yeah. What's your response to someone who doesn't get the Black Lives Matters um, point, you know, someone who likes to throw the whole "all lives matters." What, what, what's your or, response? Or blue to that? lives matter. Or blue lives matter. Yeah, because you know, to well, me, one, to me, it's kind of like 
it's like going to a breast cancer rally and being like, no, man, all cancer is bad. And it's like the people supporting, you know, the breast cancer is like, yo, that's kind of insensitive. Like, what's wrong with you? Like, we're, we're here to talk about breast cancer, not pancreatic cancer, you know? It is. It's very much insensitive and it shows a lack of logical thinking and just comprehension on a very basic level because you, we really want to say all lives matter. But first, we can go all the way back to the, you know, to the Articles of Confederation, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. None of these things were written with Black people in mind. So we were considered three-fifths of a human being until an amendment said that we were a, a whole human being. And so with that being a foundation and a block of building what the systemic system has become, all lives don't matter and that's evident. I mean, you had what they did, you know, like with the South Asians, you know, allowing them to come over and saying that, all right, to, to kind of prove that we're not racist, we're gonna create this situation to where they can come over, but they have to be highly intellectual and come over on these visas and these work visas and come over here and provide something that you know, other people can't provide. So that way we can point up and say, hey, look, we have this group of minorities here, hmm. you know, that's doing it. But it's like, you got to see through the nonsense, see through the BS, is that they were just used as like a pawn to continue this, this systemic issue that we have going on in this society. But to get to the, to the original question, is that all lives can't matter until Black lives matter. Right. You know, but you have people who are now, even Black lives matter has been, kidnapped if you will like the one that started the blm movement that started on georgetown's campus with these college kids now you have a black lives matter movement which has been trademarked by somebody who you know is receiving donations because people don't know you know in this grassroots campaign that was started it was about moving the cause forward it wasn't about you know, receiving this, you know, receiving these donations to do what? What are the donations going to be used for? Are they going to be used for programming? But no, again, if that money is going to go to somebody else's, you know, pocketbook to help do who knows what, you know, it's really not going to affect change where it needs to affect change. And so being that these practices are still continuing, people are being able to take advantage. It clearly shows that all lives don't matter because right. black lives don't matter. And the analogy you use with the cancer situation, you know, it's messed up, but it's poignant and it's perfect because it's, yo, know, we, we look, okay, cool. You know, you have these issues, you have these things, but look, uh, we're being killed at an alarming rate, you know, and it's not fair, it's not right, it's unjust. And so, you know, there needs to be an answer until we have that answer all lives aren't going to matter. And I don't want to hear that. And then when they talk about blue lives matter, look, I have family members and close dear friends that are in the military, mm -hmm. but the military, the police force, you put a uniform on, right. you can't create, you, you can't equate a uniform to a life. Right. And if you were, you know, a cop worth your weight in gold, you know, irregardless of your personal feelings, your own personal political beliefs, you should uphold the law to the letter. If somebody is breaking the law, by all means, they need to be dealt with accordingly. But again, the key word is accordingly. You know, you don't need to to be overly aggressive for a traffic stop. Right, right. You know, you don't, if somebody's, if somebody's trying to follow the rules that were created by you in your system, and then you change the rules mid-game, of course, it's going to be an issue. It's going to be confusion. It's going to be chaos. Yeah. Yeah. You know, cops have a tendency to power trip, it, especially if they feel disrespected. Then, they, then they're like, they come down with some force. And Oh, without a doubt. Yo, I'm a large black man, right? Yeah. And I only say black because black is a social construct, but that's a different conversation for a different time. It is. But... <laughs> When they see me, they don't know that I have that, you know, I have a college education. 
they don't know that I'm, you know, very well cultured. I've experienced things that they probably never experienced. Right. I've done things that they may dream of right. or have dreamed of or don't even know is possible. Yeah. But we just, black people, black males especially, just get judged. And look at me, I have a full beard out. My hair is wild and crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, but to me, it's beautiful. It's my natural locks. It's right. my beard is out. You know what I mean? It's, you, you, know, get, you, many... you get stereotyped right off the bat. And then, off, and then on top the of top. it, and then on top of it, you're of the hip hop culture. So now you throw the Yankee cap on. And <laughs> what is this is Puma, you know, right. compliments of my wife. You know, you but, usually, uh, you usually have a Yankee cap on, but I'm just saying, yeah, you know, and you know, I've experienced this. I mean, we've known each other. We've been running with each other for 20 years. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, there was an incident where we got pulled over, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So your that memory, funny inc- your memory is better than mine. So, or long term memory at least. Yeah, yeah. That, that must so, have been uh, fifteen years ago, maybe. Yeah, it was. Uh, we were down in New Haven, Connecticut. Oh, I was thinking the East, East Hartford one. There's two. Oh, the East Har- oh yeah, there, there's a few. <laughs> um. <laughs> So yeah, East Hartford. We were uh, we we're driving driving your dad's car. Yeah, that's right. Uh, AKA Viagra on wheels. That's right. It was a nice put together tinted out Honda Civic with some with some nice tins on there. <laughs> that's right. You know, that's it's right. not a car you would expect like a middle aged white man to drive. You would expect somebody like <laughs> me or you to be driving that car. Right. And so we happen to be going to, to Wendy's or yeah something. You know, back when you were doing bad things. Yeah. And yeah. um. <laughs> we passed by a cop. We were doing the speed limit. And the funny thing is, is we had a conversation before we even left your driveway about watch. Black dude, white guy in the car, in this car, I bet you they pull us over if they see us. And sure enough, maybe we just manifested it, but it happened. Yeah. I mean, nothing much came of it. They were just looking. They were probably expecting us to be, you know, doing some illicit activities but nah man we just going to 7-eleven to get something to drink hit up yeah. wendy's for some you know dollar nuggets yeah. that's it man it was so we we got pulled over i got pulled over for having a black dude in my car pretty much yeah see driving while black man yeah now but unfortunately that's the that's the state of the world we live in now new haven mm-hmm. I, my memory is so Bad. That was probably a good fifteen years ago too. Yeah, that might have been a little bit, a little bit after this particular situation. And we were out there. All I remember is a. I remember weed. We had some weed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And allegedly. Allegedly, right? And it was, was an alleged substance. Yeah, and back then weed was like a big deal. Like now, it's not as much a big deal. But. Yeah. Back then, it's like, it, you know, you're taking a heck of a so, risk by smoking and, and, you know, out outside of your private property, pretty much. Yeah, I cannot confirm nor deny that <laughs> anything was smoked. But I will say this, is that the officer did see what he assumed to be an alleged substance that, again, I cannot confirm. Uh, but, you know, in this situation, he was kind of cool because he just took what he thought was an illicit substance and kind of threw it in the sewer Mm. and was just like, all right, that was it. But again, you know, that one, you know, why can't two dudes were sitting in a parked car? We're not breaking the rules. We're not doing anything. We're just sitting here, man, on the city street. Right. And, you know, it, it happened. I mean, so that one was a little, I can, that one can go either way with me because like, all right, what are these two dudes doing on this street? And, you know, in that particular section in New Haven where we were, it does go down, you know, thing, illicit things do happen out yeah. there, but we were not partaking in any of that. We were yeah. just coming back from a show about to hop on the highway to go back to Hartford or East Hartford, wherever. There's definitely been some moments over the last 20 years, uh, you know, and this has been heavy on my heart too, is being in the hip hop industry for so long and, and 
coming through the East Hartford school system. I've, I've been the only white boy in the room many, many, many times in my life. Mm -hmm. And way more than probably the average white person. Mm -hmm. You've been there for many of those moments, whether it was a hip hop concert <laughs> or whatever, whatever it was, or mm -hmm. we were just in the hood or whatever the case is. And I have to say that all those times, I've always been accepted. And so with that said, what I'm trying to make a point on is, I, at least in my personal experience, um, black people, I think, accept white people more than white people accept black people. Without a doubt, by nature, just, I mean, not to get into like a history or anthropology lesson, but you can go all the way back. We've spread our culture across the globe, you know, before Columbus, before a lot of people touched what they want to call the quote unquote new world. So being accepting in, in trading of, of cult, you know, cultural exchanges has always been something by nature that people, especially indigenous people have, have done, but to bring it, to the right now, like the black culture, um, we're very accepting, you know, because we understand what it is to be without, to be downtrodden, to be the outcast. And right. so it's one of those things, if you don't like it, why would you treat, do, do that to somebody else? Mm -hmm. And hip hop as a culture on a macro level is accepting of, of everybody. It doesn't matter like what, if you want to align yourself with a race, a nationality, a religion, or whatever, you know, even a gang set, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, you're in a gang or whatever. Like hip hop is a culture mm -hmm. unites, you know, that that unites and brings people together very much like the cultures that that birth hip hop. Yeah, you know, you have a strong Latin culture, you know, that was there. You know, you have the Caribbean roots of hip hop, mm -hmm. you know, which were the foundation, which were the pillars. And so those cultures are very much accepted, accepting. And so we don't want to outcast anybody. We don't even, we don't even want what you have. We just want to be able to get our own. Right. You know, and so therefore if somebody, you know, wants to come into the hip hop culture that happens to be white, you know, in a predominantly, you know, person of color, you know, culture, Hey, man, as long as you down by law and you appear, to, you know, you uphold the pillars of, of what the hip hop culture is, mm. then it doesn't matter who you are, what you are, what you look like, mm. you know, come get busy. Yeah, but, I mean, I've, I've always had a lot of gratitude for that. You know, all those times we we ventured off into the hood and, you know, whether it was hanging with the, the gangsters in New Haven <laughs> or going yeah. to the hot club in Hartford, you know, and of course back then, you know, I had long hair. Sometimes it was braided. I, you know, I, I stood out like a, a sore thumb and I was still accepted, you know? Yeah. Well, that's because, I mean, there's a term that gets used sometimes loo too loosely that real recognizes real. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there were times, some of those places I was plugged in with certain gangsters that were there, people who lived, you know, who had a certain code. And so we were good. But then the bigger picture, bigger than all of that is just, we were there not to do anything on the block. We were there to rhyme. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We were there to put on a show. You know, we were there to bring entertainment. And so, you know, it's like, oh, all right, yeah, these dudes are cool. You know, we don't have to worry about pressing them. You know, we don't have to worry about certain things. You know, because with us, you know, we would go anywhere with anybody. You know, I'm, man, I remember some of the places that we ventured off to, you know, it was like, all right, man. All right, if you say so, we'll go. You know, but it, again, it's, if you're there for peace and you bring that good energy and you stay golden, nobody's going to want to have any issues with you. And if there is somebody that wants to trip and cause an issue, they're going to be regulated by 
the gatekeepers in that community in that area like nah man they not here for that we're not allowing any of that to go on right but that speaks to more of you know going back to the culture is you know it's we're very much accepting right. you know and even in even amidst all of this you know the countless number of black men that, that have been killed now up to this week uh, as of yesterday there's been five lynchings in the country mm. even with all of that the people our people are still saying we're not here for retribution we want justice we don't want to take away from you we just want equality right a fair shake and so um, yeah and america should be glad that we're not asking for retribution that we're not asking for that we're not retaliating that we're just asking for equality because it's like look man i don't want to take what you have i want to work for mine but i want to have you know the opportunity to earn mine fairly i don't want you to give me anything i want to earn it right the, you know the protests and sometimes riots depending you know they have been beautiful in the sense that there's white people out there there's hispanic people out there it's it looks vastly different than the riots from 1992 in Los Angeles. It looks like a, a big demographic of white and Hispanic people. They're upset too. And there's a lot of people wanting black lives to batter and wanting that equal ground, you know? And so in that sense, perhaps we've made some headline, uh, some headway. Yeah, definitely so. But a lot of that has to do with hip hop. Yes. To be perfectly honest, is because and sports. People love the music, and by them loving the music, sports definitely. But again, that goes to those cultures being accepting. Like I played sports from a little guy all the way up until college. Sports helped me get into college, you know. And you learn, you know, playing sports that you know what? There's people on my team I really don't like. Like, I would not hang out with this person for one second outside of the fact that we're, we're teammates. But, you, but it's like people have one goal. You know, everybody's goal is aligned, and that's to win. You know what I mean? To vanquish your opponent. You know, to, to come out victorious. And so you can take, you can make an analogy with sports. You can, you know, you can make many analogies that just people in general just want to move the ball forward. You know, they want, they want a fair shape. Yep. They want things to, to move accordingly. And, but hip hop, big factor. I mean, look, using myself as example, I didn't know who Malcolm X was until KRS one and public enemy taught me hip hop taught people things they taught white you know white suburban kids things shoot where would a lot of people be without you know public enemy and wu-tang clan and ice cube you know I, this music brought a lot of different people together and well what very much much like a riot is the voice that he had heard you know like dr martin luther king jr stated you know hip-hop was like a riot on wax, especially in the beginning. Hip hop spoke about the injustices that were going on, you know, in the communities. People were speaking out. You can go all the way back to the message, you know, and listen to that song. And a lot of stuff that you're talking about from then, like in the early to late 70s, is still going on right now in 2020. And unfortunately, you know, some people still don't get it, but you know, like these riots, this music, you know, there's something beautiful that comes out of the struggle. And people see protesters. There's always like three parts to like a, a protest or a riot. You have the protesters who are there, you know, for, you know, for, the, for whatever the cause is. And then you have the people who just, you know, like the anarchists and people who just want to, they just want to tear stuff up. And then you have the people, you know, and this is kind of sad, you have the looters. Yeah. Some of these looters feel like the only opportunity that they have is to go in a building that's on fire 
or through broken glass, mm. you know, just to get something, just to be a part of what yeah. we perpetuate is doing it as a society, doing it in a sense of, oh man, you got to have a big screen TV. You got to have the newest iPhone. You got to have the newest sneakers. You got to have this, you got to have that to, to, to be of a certain status. And so instead of trying to, you know, work up the other way, they feel, you know what? The stack, the car, the cars, the deck is stacked so much against me. This is my only opportunity to do that. And that's yeah. something that we need to look at. That's yeah. what, those are the people we need to talk to and find out why. Dude, one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. There's a documentary on Netflix called LA 92. And it's the mm -hmm. whole Rodney King incident leading up to the riots, which were very brutal riots. And this documentary, it's so profound. There's no narrator. I've never seen a documentary with no narrator. It's all B-roll. And it leads up. And once you get to the riots, there's all this footage of people looting and the Korean people protecting their stores, and, and there's like a little civil war. And then there's this one clip where there's this older black dude, and he's so upset. And he's running up to the other folks, and he's yelling at them. And he's like, this isn't right. This is messed up. Ba, 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 ba. I'm just as angry as you, but I'm not taking nothing. And he's like lecturing you know, the younger people who are taking the TVs and the, and the computers and the this and that. And it's, it's, it's powerful, powerful piece of footage. Yeah. And I, and I feel that, but to me, it's like, that's his stance. That's his point of view. I, I agree. And, I, 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 I can't even sit here and say looting is good or bad. It just is. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, if there's somebody who's like half-hearted and doesn't really want to go through it, they're just out there doing it because of the, the chaos energy that's spread amongst the people, then yeah, you can kind of divert some of those people like, look, man, you don't need to do that. But there's other people who are just like, nah, man, this is my opportunity. This is my chance. I remember, to to look, we, we've all done some dirt because we're angry in some sort of way. Like I, re I remember in college... I remember stealing a book out the bookstore and I remember justifying it because I'm like, these books are way too expensive. We're already paying tuition. That's messed up. And that's a form of revolution. That's a form of revolting. And I would say that I applaud you in the sense of it's a scheme. You know, when I was in college, we'd have a class, you know, and the professor would say, Oh, I wrote this book. Here's this book. You know, make sure you keep it because, you know, maybe next semester we'll use it for the part two of this class. And lo and behold, they change a couple sentences and voila, here's volume two. Now they got to spend another 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 dollars on a book. Yep. So it's like, look, man, you can't keep stealing from the people. You're taking advantage of the situation. Yeah. People are trying to learn and educate themselves. But you found the loophole to where, hey, I can, you know, a publisher can, you know, overcharge for a book. A university is going to pay for it or have it on their shelves because the students are going to say they need it. It's, it's a scheme, man. Yeah. So essentially you were banging on a system. Yeah. And I totally forgot about that until right now when we were just talking, it just sparked a memory of uh, 18, 19 year old Kevin. <laughs> and yeah, I think, Sometimes we get angry or we see injustice, we lash out. And so I'm not for or against looting. I, people are, you know, you know, people are very attached to their opinions. And look, after the recent incident with uh, Brooks was his last name, the kid who just got shot and killed by the police officer in a Wendy's parking lot. Yeah, that was ridiculous. That Wendy's got burnt to the ground. Yeah, you're hey, you're a victim of circumstance. Yeah. And I saw that I saw that body cam video and there was no reason to put that kid in 
in handcuffs. Everything was but fine. I, but they tried to put him in handcuffs. He was talking. So let's talk to, about that. Sure. From the video that I saw, looking at all the footage, putting everything together, it looked like he was a little inebriated in his car. He fell asleep in a parking lot. So yeah, he, 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 was him, hey. he was drunk. He was he was drunk. No doubt about it. So the officer asked him to step out and, hey, you know, move your car over here. So he moved the car over there. Now, you know, the resisting occurred for whatever reason. But up until that point, I think the officer should have let him go, much like they would do, prob like I've seen them do for, you know, white friends. I've been with, you know, friends of mine that happen to be white, you know, especially in my younger days. You know, college, you know, may have been drinking too much. I've seen cops say, hey, look, you guys had a little too much. Take it home for the night. That's it. But in this particular case, he didn't do that. Okay, you want to be a jerk and arrest him? Cool. But the issue came, again, to something we talked about in the beginning, which was attitude and ego. When that cop got punched in the face and got his taser took, yep. his ego was bruised. That's right. And so even when he turned around and fired the taser at him, yep. a taser is a non-lethal weapon. Yep. It's a non-lethal weapon. Yep. So therefore, with it being a non-lethal weapon, you know, you know it's non-lethal. Why does he get away from you? You stop and aim at this man that is running away from you. Right. That's ridiculous. But yeah. But again, that's the type of cop you don't want. One. He should have never got his taser taken from him. Yeah. He should have never allowed the person to get that close to his face for that to happen. It was two cops. And then you can bring it all the way back to what you initially said. Yeah. One cop cops. was handling himself. The other one, yeah. But one guy, you know, he shouldn't be a cop, man. Yeah. If you can't, if you don't got hands and you don't, you know, you shouldn't be a cop, man. You need to have better comprehension. You need to be able to, you know, calm situations down. There was no need to bring it to that level. But if you wanted to arrest him, you know, arrest him. You know, he, you know, he was in the wrong. Cool. Yeah. But to take it to that level and then let your ego get involved, that's where everything went downhill for me. Yep. Because the kid, the kid was harmless. He was drunk. He pretty much admitted he was drunk. And he, he called the officer, sir, and officer, Mr. Officer. Like, the, he did nothing wrong. Until they tried to put him in cuffs, then he reacted. You know, being scared of you know, being black. If he puts me in handcuffs, how do I know I'm going to even make it to the police station? Exactly. Without a doubt. But that's what we live with every day. And there's a demographic no. of people out there who don't understand. They don't, they don't, they don't see it from from this perspective for whatever reason? Well, it's hard to understand something, having the benefit of being around many different cultures. Like I grew up with Malaysians, Puerto Ricans, uh, Chinese, Japanese, Russian, like all of that was in my neighborhood. So I got to Australia and I got to experience a little bit of everything, like a little UN, right? And you know, once you learn people, you understand that you have to judge the person based on their character and what they present to you. But, but in America, there's a perception, there's a prejudice of, of, of black men that are out there that gets personified through the media and through, you know, just people holding up people that they probably shouldn't hold up as like a pillar of what black people are. And it's like, nah, man, like, I'm going to say something that's kind of controversial, but look at all the pedophilia that happens in the Catholic church. People yeah. still go to mass on Sundays. Yep. You know what I mean? You don't look at every single priest. As, I mean, you look at certain priests sideways, but they don't look at every priest and say, oh, right. he's a pedophile. Right. You know, it's, they judge it based off of, yeah. all right, this person has been dealt with. We know who this person is. The machine, so so the machine moves on. Yeah. But unfortunately, with black people is we just keep getting... We just keep getting put in the same box and we're all not the same. There's people right. who differ with my views. Right. You know what I mean? It's, you know, I have some conservative views. I have some liberal views. You know, it depends on who you, you know, what I'm dealing with and what the scenario and situation is. But there's other people who are like that. 
you know, and it's we unfortunately just in this society, man, in this time of day right now, people are tired, man. And so that's why you're having a situation. So those people who don't understand, you can't expect certain things from certain people if they've never been taught or been around it or had the opportunity to experience that. Mm -hmm. So if you're growing up in the suburbs with your family and you know, something happens, your parents are there to help you get through it. Right. Because you you know, your mom or dad is there or both of them are there and you know, you're taught opportunity. You're taught, Hey, you can be anything you want. You know, you can go off and just go adventure and explore mm-hmm. and it's cool. But is a young black male growing up, you know, you're taught, hey, man, you can't go over here. If you go over here, be careful it is. If this happens, then do this. Well, make sure you know this one and this one around here because, you know, such and such may happen. Or, oh, you can't go up there because of what goes on on that particular block and the police are always over there. And so I don't want you to get, you know, get you grouped up. Like, we're brought up with a different understanding of how you need to maneuver in life. We're Like, we're taught to survive where white people are taught to live. Yeah. And there's been plenty of times where we were in some sort of environment and I could tell that some people were intimidated by you because you're a six foot two, 300 pound black dude who doesn't know how to whisper. <laughs> you know, it's funny that you said that quick sideball. You're a loud, passionate My son guy. You told me the other day, dad, you're super loud. Yep. Yeah. He yeah. said, Dad, when you try to whisper, it's like you talking normal. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, all right. That's okay. funny. So I'm working on that. that. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's you. It's always been you since I've it known definitely you. definitely is. Since 2001 when I met you at ESPN, working in the mail room. Yeah, I'm a New Yorker. I'm passionate, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm a passionate New Yorker, man. We're loud. Yeah. And I'm a King Leo, so, you know. Yeah. And so there's been instances where we've been out and about, you know, whether we're, you know, coming back from a, a club or uh, an event and we're at Denny's or we're, we're at a, there's been plenty of times where I've, I've noticed people like, <gasps> be careful of the big black dude. I mean, they're not saying that, but that's, you can like read that on their eyes. And so, you know, you and I having, senses of humor we've always kind of made jokes about this type of stuff but in reality how about you remember this one go ahead it was after a show one night we're going to the diner in east hartford and this is when they still had jukeboxes (laughs) and parents if you're listening to this and your kids are listening (laughs) explain to them later what a jukebox is so there was a jukebox at at the where we were sitting triple a diner and i was yep and i was flipping through and I saw they had the theme for cops by Inner Circle, Bad Boys, yeah. a reggae group called Inner Circle. Yeah. And so I saw a cop there, <laughs> and I ain't have any, like, change on me. So I hit you up, like, yo, you got 50 cents? So you gave me, like, 50 cents. And I put it in, and I played it. And as soon as they heard, huh! you know, like, the, the intro to Bad Boys, the whole diner, like, started snickering and laughing. And even the cop turned around and looked in the direction. And then when he was done with his meal, he came back and was like, was that you who did that? And me being the the person I am, yeah, it was me. I did it. I had to. I couldn't help myself. (laughs) And he understood it, you know. So that was a good situation, but that's very few and far between. But I always try to break the ice. You know, but the one thing I will never do is be less than what I say I am because of, somebody else's fears or they're not sure of me. But the only thing I can do is let you experience me for me. And then you're going to see the person that I am. Right. You know, but that speaks to another issue that we're talking about, like in these days and times, like with the police, a lot of issues that we have with the police are that you have people who are in these neighborhoods who aren't from the neighborhoods who don't understand it. So somebody like you, could be a cop because you're you're of the culture you're from the culture so you understand what it is so you know somebody being loud doesn't necessarily mean they're angry that Mm -hmm. means they're passionate right you know what i mean there's certain ways in which you can handle situations you know so that's why you know a lot of people are talking about 
you know, defunding the police because you guys don't need any more tanks, man. You need some counselors. You need some therapists. You need psychiatrists. You need psychologists. Here's a question for you. I've never asked you this question in 20 years. Yep. How old were you when you realized that your ancestors were enslaved right here in America? And what was your reaction when you found out? As, man, from when I can, from when I learned how to read, write, and walk and talk. So from like an early, early age, I was told. My family history is, is documented. We're in museums, we're in history books. But um, so, but like that, those stories were told to me from a very young age. My great grandmother who helped raise me, you know, like all of us went to her house after school, like all the grandkids pretty much. And we played and we didn't have much, but her mother and her grandmother were separated during, you know, the time of slavery and around the Emancipation Proclamation, they found each other like on an auction block and they were able to, you know, go together and, you know, be together and then, you know, eventually begin to start the family. But, um, so I would say from like a very young age, cause my parents were very much proactive with that and wanted me to get a full rounded education. So not just the traditional American school system, but an appreciation of cultures, past and present and then also understanding like where we came from mm -hmm. you know and you know and i'm glad one thing that you said is that they were enslaved because a lot of people want to call them slave no they were people they were human beings that were enslaved mm -hmm. to call them a slave to me is like a smack in the face that's so you know i really appreciate that do you remember how old you were when it started to bother you like it like it it, it brought up an emotion uh, yes, I was in elementary school and I won't say his name, but a guy that was a friend of mine, <laughs> I just knew what he was trying to say and he, he got it backwards, but I knew that he had bad energy towards me and he called me a honky and I told him, I'm not a honky. I'm a nigger. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And so, but that's at a young age. But, and my parents didn't use that word. But to me, it was, hey, if you're going to call me something, call me the right thing. Mm. Damn sure don't call me that. But that speaks to a different level, uh, a level, different level of indoctrination that I had experienced that. Because kids throw words you know, luckily, around. Kids like to pick on each other, throw words around. I remember mm -hmm. being called Jew boy and dreidel boy and stuff like that. So you're saying this kid reversed it in his head by accident. Yeah. Right? Uh-huh. And you were upset. But it goes, oh, what? Super upset. And i tell you something, even uh, uh, another experience that I had. So, you know, my great grandmother, my great grandmother that I speak of, you know, I was on Rat Road, which is, you know, you can research it and find out the history of that. You know, before it was starting to be developed in the mall and everything was over there, we used to ride our bikes up and down the street. So one day I was like riding my bike, playing around just by myself. And I remember this guy driving by. He called me a nigger and threw an open switchblade at me. Mm. So if I hadn't have moved, we might not be here right now having this conversation. Mm. You don't use the N-word. And so nah. uh, for, for people listening right now that don't understand the N-word, okay, I, even I could tell you about the N-word. When you use it with an A, it's a, a term of endearment, like saying brother. And white people aren't allowed to say it, period. <laughs> it's against the rules. Nah, don't do it. And yeah. so uh, I've been around that word being in the hip-hop industry and being around black culture for a very long time. And, you know, our other business partner, Milo, he's somebody that uses the word a lot. And, you know, lots of people do. You don't use it. No, nah, I mean, that's something that comes from that's a choice. Know, my upbringing. Yeah. 
I mean, I you I can't say I never used it, but once I really got on my quest for knowledge itself, once I found out the true meaning of where it came from, that's when I, I decided this was back like in you know, junior high, high school. And I was like, nah, I'm gonna not use this word anymore because as I was always taught, if you wanna if you want change to happen, you have to be the change that you want to happen. Mm-hmm. So I used to be bad though. Like I, people would say that I would be like, you don't call me that. You know where that name comes from? And, you know, because as you were explaining, like the ER, you know, is the quote unquote derogatory form of the word with the hard ER right. with the A, as you said, is some considered like a term of endearment. Right. And, you know, I've gotten to the point where now it does, it still bothers me when I hear it. I still cringe a little bit, but I totally understand how some people have taken a word and adopted it, you know, to, as a term of endearment, but it's just not one that I choose to use. I feel like you and I are great examples because you grew up around a, di- a diverse amount of people. And you, you said that earlier. I did mm-hmm. as well. I, the East Hartford school system was very diverse. I went to school with black kids, white kids, Hispanic kids. I even got Indian friends, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. and I didn't even know what racism was until around the Rodney King incident. And I was probably 12, maybe 11, 12. Well, well that gets to another point, which is dun, 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 white privilege. Right. Right. Is that you have the ability to not even really go out your way, not to experience it, but you just don't have to deal with it mm-hmm. because you're able to go to and from where you want to go without being questioned, without there being like any circumstances. Me, from when I was a little kid up until now, you know, I have to be mindful. I have a son. I have to tell my son how to move because he didn't necessarily grow up in a similar environment that I did. But, you know, I tried to instill in him certain things, but we are an example of what, you know, people not being prejudiced and racist, you know, what it could be like. Right. But I think the cure, really the only cure is, is, is love. And love is a crazy thing, which is caring more about somebody else more than you do yourself. But as a, as a human, you should care about your fellow human being. Before the color of your skin, before anything, we're humans. And right. every human deserves the right to, to live an unobstructed life as long as they're not infringing on anybody else's. Right on. But we have this fake, this caste system that isn't spoke about that, you know, needs to be done. So I would say love, man, but people aren't ready to love, man. People aren't ready to get out of their comfort zone. But what you know, about stop racism? What about the school systems now? It, I guess you can say it worked for me and it worked for you. Our other brother and former business partner, Milo Chef, was part of the famous Chef versus O'Neill case back in 1989. And we witnessed that firsthand, you know, being in business with him and everything that, that engulfed. Yeah. Toe to toe with senators. What up, Blumenthal? Yeah. Uh, Blum, yep. Senators and all sorts of political nonsense i mean could you describe what that case is to somebody that doesn't know uh the chef versus o'neill case was essentially milo sued the state of connecticut for equal education so that the kids in the quote-unquote inner cities could have the same educational opportunities as the kids out in the burbs like a cheshire glassenberry farmington right you know, like those areas, you know. But um, me, per- to answer your question, I think our educational system is a joke. I mean, it's archaic. It's built on an old calendar. I think it needs to be reformed, much like the system does, because in my personal opinion, from what I've seen, uh, I don't hold a lot of weight with education. I look at it as like a game, and they just want you to, like, regurgitate what they teach you. You know, oh, Black History Month, we're going to teach about some happy Negroes 
that uh that we're okay with. You know, we're not going to teach you about, you know, the Panthers. We're not going to teach you about, you know, the movement out of Philadelphia, you know, out of Baltimore. You know what I mean? They, they don't – they teach us what they want us to know to keep us, quote, unquote, docile. Right. But um, it's not a well-rounded education, but that's by design. You know, even even in the suburbs, they don't get the best education that they could Mm-mm. because education is supposed to be a worldly thing. If the Chef O'Neill case became like a, a, a thing, I mean, and it did, it took many years and magnet schools came about because of it and whatnot. But let's just say in a dream world, it worked across the country and mm-hmm. starting in kindergarten, white kids are going to school with black kids and black kids are going to school with Hispanic kids. And, and we're all going to school together instead of there being white schools, black schools, wouldn't that chip away at racism? Because even if a parent is trying to raise their kid racist, then they got to go to school with black kids and they logic will kick in eventually and be like, that's just a human being with different skin color and different hair. Ideally you would like to have that kumbaya moment. Mm -hmm. And although kids spend more time at school than they do around their parents, the parents have a much longer lasting effect because that's who you're comfortable with. That's who you look to for protection and guidance. And so you're going to learn like I experienced then, like that kid who called me a honky, he learned that from home, man. Right. Or he learned that from another kid on the playground that said it and he just repeated it. Mm -hmm. But do you remember when Giovanni was little, there was this park he showed me somewhere in Farmington. And there was an Indian woman there. And she had a daughter that was around the same age as my son. And I would bring a ball or different things for my son to play with. You know, so, you know, we'd throw the ball. He'd run around, be climbing. And me and you'd be having conversation about whatever. I mean, as my son and her daughter played. And then she realized that, you know, who her daughter was playing with, because she was on the phone doing whatever. No, she was still paying attention to her kid, but not really like deep entrenched in what her kid was doing. But when she realized her kid, her daughter was playing with the black kid, then it was, oh no, come here, Mm. give the ball back. And I'm like, no, it's okay. She can play with it. No, 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 that's okay. And then I remember going there another time and that girl being there. And then my son playing in a sandbox on this, you know, little truck thing in there and her wanting to go play with him and then playing together. And then the mother noticing it and then saying, no, 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 come here, come here, come here, come here. So you can teach all you want in school, but what the parent says yeah. in a lot of cultures is kind of going to be what goes. But the one thing is that with this society and bringing it back to hip hop is that the educational system, all of that is for naught because people are really making up their own mind. Mm. And they're saying, you know what? This kid right here isn't that bad. Or I don't know what you're talking about. You know, when I go over here, you know, I don't have any issues. I hang out with black kids. You know, I hang out with white kids. You know, everybody's all inclusive. So we have a lot of work to do. I don't think the school system is going to be the place where it happens. Mm. Because unfortunately, the system is the system. So you can keep trying to, until you create a new system, or totally rework the system, you're going to get the same result. Yeah. What do you think about the Morgan Freeman way? Morgan Freeman did an interview probably like 10 years ago on 60 Minutes. And he was like, look, if we want to end racism, we just need to stop talking about it. No more Black History Month. Just stop talking about it and just move on. In theory, that's cool. You can stop talking about racism, but it still exists. Like yeah. up north, racism is alive and well. You know, um, it's just people move around racism differently up here. They may not necessarily vocalize it like you see, you tend to see in the south. Mm. You know, up here, it may be more of uh, the smile in your face and, mm-hmm, no, we're not going to give that job to him. I'll give you an example. I was working at ESPN and, you know, I interned at some amazing places and had 
you know, some nice experience. And it was a job that I wanted because, you know, music was always my love, but I wanted to get in the technical side of things. So on paper, when you hear my name, it doesn't sound like the quintessential black name. Right. It may sound come off as like a white person's name or whatever. So longer story shorter, I sent my resume, you know, talked to a contact who tried to push me through. So the gentleman calls me, was like, oh, I just got your resume. Uh, I want to bring you in for an interview. Can you come in today? And I was, you know, I was still in the mail room. And I was like, uh, well, I'm not really dressed for it, unfortunately. You know, I'd like to give the best presentation of myself, you know, for for this for this. He was like, oh, I don't care about what you what you dress like. I mean, this is TV. Nobody's gonna see you. You're gonna be behind the camera anyway. Blah blah blah. So I'm like, all right. And now he sang my praises and begged me to come to do this interview with mm-hmm. him. As soon as I walked in his office, and he saw. He looked at my resume, then looked at me, and looked at my resume, and said, "You're W. Taylor." And I was like, "Yeah." And he was like, "Oh, yeah." Well, looking at your resume, uh, maybe the tape library would be a better place for you. You know, we'll see. You know, I, I can see what happens over there. And I was like, "But you called me over here for tech ops <laughs> for this particular position, like you." I told you I didn't want to come because I wasn't prepared, you know, because I wasn't the best representation of myself. You told me never mind just to come anyway, that you loved my resume. But now I'm standing before you and you're telling me tape library? Nah, man, I'm good. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm out. But, you know, that's Scooby Snack racism. You know, I eat that all day. (laughs) Right, right. It's easy to palate that. Right. You know, but it's stuff like that that we deal with. That's racism. You know what I mean? He had the power to put me in a position. But because he saw who I was, all of a sudden on paper, you know, on paper I was fine. But he looked at me and said, no. He liked your resume. And back then, just so you know, I was 225, 230, clean cut, wave spinning, make you seasick. You know what I mean? So it wasn't like I walked in right now. Now, you know, hey, man, this is my hair. This is me. Accept me for who I am. Right. You know, we're in our early 40s. Where do you, where's racism going to be 20 years from now when we're entering our seniorhood? I don't know, man. It wasn't until like the 60s that we were able to start to get, you know, equal rights to a certain degree. And things still ain't equal. So look what we're dealing with now, years later, 40, 50, 60 years later. We're still dealing with the same stuff. So I hope that these protests, these young people out here fighting a good fight, these frontliners, keep up the fight, man, because that's what we need. I mean, we just need to just demolish the whole system, burn everything down and recreate it. You know, and I'll say burn it down figuratively. Right. You know, just get rid of these systems that we have, the super antiquated things need to be updated for the now, you know, but we need solidarity and we need to keep the fight moving, you know, and I know there's a lot of other groups that want to latch on to equal opportunity, but right now the focus is on black lives and them mattering like they should, you know, we can get to everything else right now. This is very, very poignant and very important. So I think that racism is going to be where we lead it or where we don't lead it. Yeah. And, you know, my favorite poet, Jermaine Williams, Secrets Amongst Cosmonauts, a very great song. Yeah, man. He says in that song that we have to overcome racism or the cosmonauts won't come and save us. So... It's, it's like a test. It's like a human test. And for those that are caught up on it, they're failing. They're failing miserably. And we we have to get over it. Because certainly, you know, a one-year-old black kid and a one-year-old white kid, they don't, they could play in the sandbox, no problem. Like there's no, 
issues whatsoever. It's it's society. It's social engineering. Yeah, well. it is. You know, and I have a two year old nephew who goes to school. There's other black kids in his school. There's you know all there's a cross section of people of different nationalities that go to his school but the kid he linked up with is wally a little two-year-old white kid him and wally are thick as thieves man Mm. because they're both in the trucks they're both like running around and you know it's who he gravitated to it wasn't because wally was white it was because wally likes trucks like he likes trucks commonality yeah and that's the one thing that we don't do is like we we focus more on the differences than we focus more than, you know, what we're alike. Yeah. And and that's us. When we were yeah. in our early 20s, we met at ESPN and we were both obviously into TV production and we were both yeah. into hip hop. And I walked into the mailroom very cocky and said, you listen to Hot 93. <laughs> no, your first words was, were... Oh, you listening to my station? <laughs> this is your station. Yeah. What do you mean it's your station? Oh, I work up at Hot 937. I'm, K- I'm K-Dub. Yeah, right. For real, man. And then it was, all right, get me a job. I want to work in promotions. All right, let me see what I could do. <laughs> a few days later, I get a call from the infamous Joe Lee. <laughs> You ended up getting a job, didn't you? Yeah, of course. And then we became thick as thieves. Hey, man, you know, you know, more of a brotherhood, man. Like, cause, and that's the other thing, man, is that, like, if I was a type of person, and this is this is what I mean, like, if I was a type of person who just wanted to hold on to anger and animosity for everything that was done to you know, to my people, by other people who may be similar hue to you, I would have missed out on being a great person that taught me so many things. And together we created opportunities and things that we probably wouldn't, we probably wouldn't have done. I can't say never have done, but things that most people probably would never do. You know, if you just run back all the, all the business things, all just the real life experiences. Yeah, man. You know, but the thing is, is that you're an ally, man. And, mm-hmm. you know, we used to joke with you all the time and say, you're not white, you're dub skinned. Right, right. You know, but that was because that spoke to your character, to your soul, to your energy. Right. You know, and it was bigger than race. For those listening, I just want to supply some context. My my nickname was Dub. So yeah. that's why he said dub skinned. Yeah. He used to jump through speakers, but, uh, that's right. you know, that's a whole nother thing, but, uh, <laughs> it's, um, I definitely think people just need to be open, man. And people need to be really grateful and really understand that all we're asking for is equality, justice, and understanding instead of retribution. Right. You know, because if we went that old Testament eye for an eye, things could be vastly different. Mm. But, you know, I just think we need people like you. We just need people who are pro-thought, who are pro-finding a solution, not dwelling on a problem. But we can't forget about the problem. We still have to deal with that because the systematic oppression that that continues is disgusting. And it's going to stop one way or another. So this was something I was going to say before you asked the question about you know, what do you tell people who want to end racism or, you know, who don't understand? And it's like, at this point, you either know or you don't know. You got to pick a side right now, mm. either on the side of justice and equality or you're part of the problem. If you're part of the problem, you're going to get weeded out and rolled over. So that is your choice. Mm. But I say be part of the solution, man, because it's beautiful on this side. Well said. <laughs> All right, man. Good talk. All right, man. Walk with peace. (laughs) That's an inside joke because I used to sign off on the radio with Walk with Peace. (laughs) Go figure. All these years later, I'd be doing a podcast called Inner Peace. 
If you are looking for some more inner peace, be sure to go stream or download my brand new meditation album, which is available on Spotify and Apple and everywhere else. Go get that and start training your brain and get relaxed in this world. You're going to need it. If you're looking for me, go to drreese.com. That's doctor spelled out. And I'll talk to you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese. If this episode opened your heart, feel free to share on social media and tell your loved ones. Also, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next time, may peace be with you.